My name is Jarth McKenzie. I'm the Occupational Health and Safety um, Services Manager here at the Manufacturing Safety Alliance of BC. Today we're doing hazard identification and control and arguably one of the most important elements out of all elements uh, in a health and safety management system because everything is based on this or has uh, influence of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to jump right into it. So for today's objectives, we the plan is to become more familiar with the legal framework for the hazard identification and control, to understand responsibilities as the employer, a supervisor, and a worker, and how that relates to hazard ID and control, to understand the process of identifying hazards, uh, assessing risks, and implementing adequate controls, and identifying and understanding the relevance of processes to the audit requirements. I've changed some of the slides and um, we've added additional polling questions today. So there's going to be 18 throughout the program here today, the webinar. So uh, we're going to try something new and see how well this works with uh, multiple questions. Okay, so we're going to start this slide again here. What is a hazard identification and control program required? It makes good business sense. Um, just like the next statement there, due diligence, it provides uh, an extra layer of insurance for workers, uh, employers, and, and supervisors, as well as it identifies what the potential risks are. It also minimizes the risk of workers or illness. So when we look at what the hazards are or recognize what the potential hazards are, um, we need to put in control measures to mitigate these risks and we'll talk about that later. It also um, helps reduce property damage when we look at what the potential risks again of either operating that piece of equipment um, and then to be complacent with the regulatory requirement. This is one of the big ones that WorkSafe uh, uh, pays strong attention to and one of the easiest ways to defend yourself if you have a visit with WorkSafe is what they want to see is one, that you've identified the problem and you're doing something about it. When you can say that you've identified the problem, you've done a risk assessment and you're looking at putting in potential uh, or temporary control measures, you're talking the language that they want to hear and this will help you out. So some of the definitions we're going to uh, we're going to quote a few definitions of what a hazard here is. A hazard is a source or situation with a potential for harm in terms of human injury or ill health, damage to the business or the environment or any combination of these three. The next definition is what is a risk? And the risk is the likelihood that a hazard will cause injury illness and damage and we'll touch on these obviously as we go through the webinar. The legislation, again we're talking about the Workers' Compensation Act here and we will talk about WorkSafe BC regulation. So remember these are the two legal bodies that um, we need to abide to. So the Workers' Compensation Act Part 3 Division 3 and it'll be reading right from the regs. But Section 115, Section 2A requires that the employer must remedy any work condition that are hazardous to the health and safety of the employer's workers. So what this definition means is the employer, management, owners need to remedy any kind of potential situation that has the uh, potential to harm uh, a worker. The legislation, uh, Workers' Compensation Act Part 3, Division 3, this time Section 116, 2E, requires workers to report to the supervisor or the employer any contravention of this part of the regulations or an applicable order of which the worker is aware of in the absence of or defect of any protective equipment, device or clothing or the existence of any other hazards that the worker considered is likely to endanger the workers or any other persons. So again, this is the Workers' Compensation Act saying that workers are also 
responsible to report the injuries. Now it says here that you need to report to your supervisor and employer. Normally, um, with a small business, maybe that is could be the same person. It could be all in one. In bigger companies, there is a, a procedure to go to your supervisor first, then a joint health and safety committee member, or if we're all small biz, uh, businesses here, you only need a worker representative. That might be the person to go through before you go to the employer. It all depends on what your relationships are. On to the next definition will be the Workers' Compensation Act, Part 3, Division 3, Section 117.1a. This requires the supervisors to ensure the health and safety of all workers under the direct supervision of the supervisor. So what this says is the supervisor is responsible for the people that they oversee. So again, the Workers' Compensation Act on these three um, sections define responsibility from the employer, the supervisor, and the worker. All three have a legal responsibility in dealing with uh, hazardous situations. In the OHNSRs, which is your Occupational Health and Safety Regulations, Part 3, Rights and Responsibilities, identifies the requirement for an Occupational Health and Safety Program. Section 3.3, Division, or Provision, sorry, for the regular inspection of the premise, equipment, work methods, work practices at appropriate intervals to ensure prompt action is undertaken to correct any hazardous conditions found. So this is talking about putting a program in place and having regular inspections and that could be anything from a daily inspection that should be done on all mobile equipment if you have forklifts or cranes to uh, equipment and that regular whether that's a regular maintenance or depending on the task. Um, in previous companies there was inspections done uh, repeatedly before the, each task began, a new task began or at a minimum of, of, of daily. So it all depends on what the uh, manufacturer and the nature of work both suggest on the frequency of when uh, inspection should occur. So that's our little quick summary of lesson one which is talked about the introduction, we talked about the definitions of the manager, um, the employer, sorry, the supervisor, the worker, all having responsibilities, and then the legislation around that, whether it's the Workers' Compensation Act or the OHS regulation. I don't have any questions for uh, summary one. I, I think that's pretty straightforward. It's a bit of a repeat from um, the first webinar, so we'll just jump into the second section here. Lesson two, the identification methods. We are going to look at hazard classes, methods of identification, a risk matrix, and the hierarchy of control. So we need to talk about the different kinds of hazard classes. Hazards are generally put into one of four classes. And this is, again, what WorkSafe wants to see. And this is what our, the OC audit wants to see. These four classes are physical, the chemical, the biological, and the psychological. The next couple of slides here will break down uh, each one of these uh, with examples and further definitions. So at this point, you need to consider the circumstances at your place, your own workplace. What are your physical hazards? What are your chemical hazards? What are your biological hazards? And what are your possible psychological hazards? So what is a physical hazard? A physical hazard could be anything that's impact. So hit by, struck by, struck against. That's an impact. Any noise. It could be too much noise where they can't hear, or you can't hear an audible noise of uh, a truck backing up, or it could be too little noise. Um, maybe the alarm doesn't go off, or maybe something that's supposed to sound doesn't sound. And there's even the chance that uh, I've had it happen in companies where people are overprotected with their hearing protection, where they have too much, which is creating uh, an additional hazard. Temperature is another big one, especially with the current weather that we have outside with the humidity. 
Temperature could be the, either be too hot, the humidity, we talk about hydration, heat stroke, or it could be um, too cold. If you're working in the oil and gas industries, they, they work 15 minutes and then they have to warm up for 45 minutes or so and then go back out again. So temperature could be, and it doesn't have to be oil and gas now, it could be just winter time, it, it's a bit different, right? So uh, temperature is uh, a physical hazard, whether it's too hot or too cold. The next one is lighting. And again, this could be too much lighting or too little lighting. So poor lighting, a lot of companies are now going to the LED, it's a brighter light. And uh, I have some companies that have, um, are using it to switch on with a motion sensor. So there's no flicking of switches and uh, it saves power that way. So there's a cost effective that way because um, the brighter lights. Uh, so that's bright lights. I've been in situations where there, it's too bright and they can't see, but I've also been in situations where the lighting is very poor and needs to be brought up, creating uh, potential hazards. Any kind of vibration, so um, this could be from a handheld tool or sitting on a machine, vibration. Radiation, for this one, WorkSafe likes to focus on ionizing radiation, not uh, non-ionizing radiation. So we're talking about if you have an x-ray machine. We're not talking about if you're doing a little bit of welding and there's uh, your radiation that way. That's a non-ionizing radiation. Anything electrical, this kind of makes sense. That's self-explanatory. And ergonomic issues. The number one category of injuries throughout whatever work industry, in not even just in BC but in Canada, is MSIs, which is your musculoskeletal injuries. These are basically due to ergonomic issues, um, but they are more than 50% of all hazards uh, and uh, time loss claims uh, deal with ergonomic issues, which are based off of uh, musculoskeletal injuries. So there's a good summary of uh, potential uh, physical hazards. Um, there may be some additional ones that may apply specifically to you, but generally that's a that's a good start of what examples of the physical hazards are. The next we're going to talk about a chemical hazards. So these could be gases, vapors, mists, fumes, dust, fibers. So just to give a quick definition of each one of these. So a gas is obviously a gas. A vapor is actually a liquid that is small enough to be a, suspe a suspended particle in the air. Whereas, uh, sorry, a vapor is the gas, sorry. Vapor is the gas. The mist is the liquid particle that's suspended in air. Whereas the fume, such as welding fumes or the smoke that we're dealing with outside, is actually a solid particulate that is small enough to be airborne. So that's the difference between the vapors, the gas, the mist is actually a liquid that's in the air, the fume is actually a solid that's in the air, and then we have dust and fibers, and the best way to differentiate between the two of those is fibers has a three to one ratio on its size. So it's whatever one millimeter up, three millimeters long, where a, a piece of dust can be uh, any size in any shape. So for chemical hazards, these are the six main examples. For biological hazards, we have bacteria, molds, viruses, indoor air quality, and needle sticks and punctures. And the last one's kind of interesting because I, in my personal life, have worked with two colleagues at different times throughout my life who have been accidentally pricked with someone else's needle. Um, and it had nothing to do with them being, uh, having any use for the needles themselves. So there is a huge hazard around uh, becoming um, contaminated by being accidentally uh, pricked with a, a needle. Um, indoor air quality, um, uh, sick building syndrome is a good example of that, whereas the, the breathing, the coughing, the sneezing puts airborne particles, they touch things, uh, and, and you know, the general rule is, is 
if, when you're sick, stay home. Don't bring it to the office because everybody else gets it. There's a various amount of molds out there, viruses and bacteria. Usually bacteria around anything that's got still water um, is a good example of that one. And then any of these can enter the body through inhalation, injection, uh, ingestion, or skin contact. And this is the best way that I like to think of the difference between the chemical and the biological. Think of biological, that's anything that enters the body, whereas the chemical can be outside. Although you can drink a chemical, I wouldn't advise doing that. But um, for biological, I like to think of it as inside the body. So for psychological, this really doesn't come up unless uh, you do an incident investigation and most times there are contributing factors and we're going to give a, a list of some of them here and this is when this one really shines unfortunately is it is a contributing factor when, when things go wrong. Um, so fatigue is a big one. So whether they're working at a fast pace uh, beyond what they can do um, or general fatigue, too long of a day or maybe they're doing other things outside of work and they're coming to work not in the best shape uh, to do the work that needs to be done. Sleep deficit is a, a major one. I had one of my companies where an individual was helping his wife with the breastfeeding and um, nearly cut his finger off the next day using the bandsaw because you'll see another one of these uh, is called lack of mind on task. Um, he wasn't thinking he was overtired. He shouldn't have been doing the job that he was doing. He should have passed it off that day. Um, shift work is a big one, whether it's the beginning of the shift or the end of the shift. And this is even goes for the end of the week. You'll see a lot of people, uh, most people kind of check out half halfway through Friday afternoon, or especially if it's going into a long weekend. So um, there's also statistics to show that at the end of a two-day, two-night, or if you're four days on, four days off, the, the last day is usually, um, it'll see a spike in injuries then. There's also stress. Stress can be internal or external. Internal meaning, um, let's just call it work-related. So trying to get the production done. Uh, it could be stress from a supervisor or manager. It could be a conflict interest there. But it also could be stress from home, and that's what I mean externally. So it could be uh, a death in the family, uh, some marital problems, uh, some kid problems, uh, anything if, uh, outside of work. Um, you know, if it's affecting them outside of work, it's affecting them inside of work as well. And then, as I said earlier, lack of mind on task. A lot of times this one shows up when you're doing something repetitively, uh, you're no longer really thinking of what you're doing and you're just into a pattern so um, especially when you're working around powerful equipment that uh, you know a one second mistake leaves you a lifetime of results uh, it is a, a very considerable one working alone um, has some psychological factors in isolation kind of the same thing but um, you can see uh, needing to check in. Some people don't like the fact that they're the only ones. There could be security reasons. I'm not sure what uh, the businesses are or maybe you have someone at the reception desk. They could be considered working alone if uh, if they don't have a panic button. I know I was just at a place that had just recently installed a panic button for the reception. Technically there's people in the building but if something was happening right away she is left on her, on her own. Uh, bullying this could be uh, internally, as I said, from uh, a co-worker, supervisor, management. Uh, violence in the workplace. Something just happened recently a couple weekends ago down the road from our office here in Chilliwack where there was a, uh, uh, let's call it a person of suspicion in a vehicle that was gunned down. So outside of the Cal Tire in Chilliwack, there was, uh, the car was, uh, was shot up and the, the individual did pass away so there was a fatality there so it, it was uh, um, it was deliberate um, so that had the possibility violence in the workplace is basically violence outside of work that comes to the workplace 
So luckily, no one at Cal Tire that would be innocent of the whole situation wasn't struck by a, a, a stray bullet there. And then fear of, this is an interesting one because it could be fear of heights, fear of a flame, fear of uh, something being very heavy, fear of um, making a mistake. Maybe it's a very costly part. I was just at an aviation company where they have a little uh, piece of instrument that's six inches by six inches in shape, but its price is $15,000. So if someone makes a mistake there, it's $15,000 that they can't fix, and that's a loss. So uh, it could be a fear of um, of ruining that part, which would also then increase the stress, and then hopefully they are not uh, have a little one at home. But you can see how it all adds up there as contributing factors, um, and that's a good indication of all the psychological. Not all of them, but uh, the majority. Most can fall under one of these categories. For the methods of identification, one of the first things we need to do is have job task hazard analysis. So what we mean by that is every organizational job description for which the hazard of the job tasks are identified and analyzed for risk. So what this means is for every position in your company, we should have a description of that job description. right? Under that job description, we are then going to do what we're going to get into it here in a minute is a hazard assessment and then do a standard operating procedure. So how do we prioritize the hazards? We need to look at this. There's three main categories of how we prioritize. There's a high risk, medium risk, and low risk. So a high risk could be something that we could consider a critical task, which is something that takes more than one person to do that, um, you know, if you're operating something that takes two cranes or two forklifts to unload off your truck, that's a critical task. It doesn't have the ability, any kind of task, it doesn't have to have two things involved, but any kind of task that uh, a fatality or a very, very serious incident could occur, that would be considered a high risk. Then your medium risk is a bit lower than that, and we'll get into how this defines in a minute a medium risk right down to a low risk. For audited purposes, the thing we want to do is for high risk hazards, we want to review them on a yearly basis. So high risk is yearly, every year. Medium risk is every two to four years. And low risk hazard assessments need to review the five plus years. That being said, if there's a change in process, if there's an incident or a near miss, it may need to be reviewed um, at that time. So that may reset the clock. If someone's got hurt, we need to look at was it what we created? Was it the hazard assessment, the standard operating procedure, the supervision, or was it the human factor? We need to look at that. So this is what a risk matrix looks like. Um, it's considered a five by five. If you look at the, the multiplier numbers, um, and I'll, I'll explain it. So the risk matrix, we have two axes. One is the likelihood, and the other one is the consequence. So the likelihood, as we see there, how often does it happen? Um, I'll start at the top, rare, unlikely, possible, likely, certain, or another way of saying it is heard of it, yearly, monthly, weekly, daily. And then we look at the consequences. There's five different categories here for the consequences. There's insignificant, which would be first aid. So you're handling this on site with your first aid attendant. Your minor is medical aid. Medical aid is anything where the individual or employee needs to leave uh, your facility. And this could even be for a walk-in clinic. Maybe something's got, uh, an individual's got something in their eye, the first aid attendant tries to flush it, it needs to go to medical aid. They need to go to a walk-in clinic and they can get it out there. It gets recorded as a medical aid. The next one is a moderate, and STD is short-term uh, disability. And the next one with a high or a long-term disability. And then we have the extreme. So the way this works is we look at how often we do it and then what the, the potential consequence is. And we're going to show a hazard assessment in a couple of slides, but we're going to focus on one of the examples where they rate it as a four by four. And what that means is the likelihood of the task 
is likely, weekly. That gives us the four. And then the classification is that uh, the injury is a long-term disability. So we take the four, we run across, and it matches up in the high category, which is the four in gray, and we get a number 16. So we went vertically. If we look at the multiplier of the numbers that are in gray, we said that it happened weekly, so we give it a four, and we're going to run that across until we get to the column of high. And where it meets is a red 16. So that's our little score there is the 16. Now we'll get into the different colors. So we have red, yellow, and green. The red is what we consider an A hazard. And an A hazard, we stop work immediately and implement corrective actions. That's a stop whatever you're doing, fix it right away. A B hazard is we need to have corrective actions and we can apply them as soon as reasonable but work may continue. And then our final one is a, a C hazard, and that's anything that's green. So we continue operation as permissible with the appropriate identified controls. So again, the A hazard, we stop work immediately. In the yellow, we need to address it, and it needs to be done quickly, but we can still go on, but maybe there's a, a verbal warning or some extra care put there. Anything in the green, we continue on as the day goes on. Um, as I said, the example that we'll show in a bit will be a four by four, and that's how we've come to this number. Again, the likelihood was likely or weekly, gives us a four in the gray. And then the consequence was high, long-term, that's a four. Where those two meet was the red 16. Um, so this is, the, is a five by five risk matrix. Um, there is a three by three, but I give you or caution you on that. I've compared a company that has used a three by three, and three by three would only be three options on the X axis and three options on the Y axis. Um, there is a considerable difference when you use a three by three as opposed to a five by five. Um, this is one of the simpler versions of this. It can get right complicated where you, you can get into, I've seen ones with, not only do they measure an, an element of chemical exposure, but what the TWA is, the time weighted average, what the concentration is, it can get as complicated as you want. Um, but this is the one that we use for training and we've had a lot of success on it. It looks a bit uh, intimidating at first if you've never seen one, but um, after a few practices it really becomes quite, uh, quite easy to use. My next question here is, um, this is considered the hierarchy of control and it goes with the risk matrix. So the most effective is at the top, the least effective is at the bottom. Um, and then we'll, we'll just go through these one by one. So the top one is elimination. If we can eliminate the hazard, and as it says off the side, physically remove the hazard, this is ideal. That being said, in the real world, uh, I haven't seen this done very often at all. Um, eliminate it because it's the nature of the work there are potential hazards there but we can do things around that the next level down is substitution and this is to replace the hazard a good example of this is uh, replacing a chemical that is a carcinogen or a cancer causing agent if we can replace that chemical with another chemical that's not a cancer causing agent uh, that we've eliminated some of the risk towards our workers um, it also could be something that um, it's not just dealing with our workers, but let's call it Mother Earth, the environment. There may be chemicals out there that are, are more green, um, that are not as toxic or hazardous to the environment as well that uh, we may want to look at. The next level down is engineering control. And in general, this is to isolate the people from the hazards. So here we're looking at things that are man-made. So that's the way I like to look at it. So a process control. So um, the workflow is, is fluid. And you're not taking one piece back and forth across the floor um, when it could go to the next person beside you. Uh, putting someone in isolation, and isolation means away from the hazard. Um, some of the jobs I've seen where they are dealing with some very toxic chemicals, they have a, 
a little container where they have to put their hands through the rubber gloves that's sealed and they can do their work inside that. That would be a uh, considered an engineering control. Uh, one of the general ones that uh, most people use is uh, ventilation. So if you're welding or uh, you got chemicals, uh, having exhaust fans, um, and this is a, obviously a step up from a hole in the ceiling that's just got a fan running. Um, I've seen that happen and people try and argue that one. Um, any kind of safeguarding is an engineering control. It's a man-made, so if it's the safeguarding on a chop saw or a grinder or we're protecting the worker from nip points, um, any kind of safe any kind of safeguarding um, or some kind of mechanical equipment that's an engineering control the next one is administration and this, here it says to change the way people work so what we're looking here is for policies procedures rules regulations uh, supervision job rotation they're all examples of uh, administrative controls and the very bottom of our hierarchy of control is the PPE, which is your personal protective equipment. And it's the protect the worker. And although it is required, it's not the end result because the PPE does nothing to mitigate the hazard. Meaning we can put on all the PPE that we want in our let's all you know, let's put someone in a bubble suit, but if if you're working in a place that's got broken glass all the time, the it doesn't work. There is a need for PPE. Don't get me wrong here, but that's at the bottom. And when we look at this, the lower you are on, on the hierarchy of the control, the more supervision is needed. We need to make sure that our employees are wearing their appropriate PPE, whether that's uh, steel toe boots or safety glasses, hearing protection, high vis, hard hat, gloves, whatever. As we move up the, the scale to have policies, procedures, and training, and maybe we have some engineering controls. You can have any combination of these. And in most instances, there's, there's a combination of one or two or three of these um, all impacting uh, the hazard. So you're not limited to just pick one. It could be a combination of all three. That's what I want you to take away. It could be a combination of all three. And PPE is considered the last resort because it does nothing to mitigate the hazard. So this looks very complicated, but let me break it down to you. So what we have here is the task is an angle grinder. And uh, up at the top in the light green, we have the different kind of hazards. B equals biological, which we talked about. C equals chemical. P equals physical. PSY equals um, the psychological. Um, then what we need to do is... So earlier I said we looked at a scenario that was four by four. I showed it out on the, um, the risk matrix. Um, if we look at the, the last point on this uh, section of the hazard uh, risk assessment, so we're looking at lowering into onto the project. So here they have no biological, no chemical, no psychological, but the physical hazard is identified to cut to the hand, body, or eye, right? So remember, we looked at our risk matrix. We looked at the likelihood, which is the four. If we run all the way up, that's the likelihood. We looked at what the consequence is. That was uh, a four as well. It just so happens that four by four, four times four is 16. And if we go to our risk matrix, and I can quickly go back to that in a minute here, it gave us an A hazard. So I want to quickly do that just to go back this slide here. So if we look at the likelihood was likely, which is a four. The consequence was high. It's a four. And we came to, if you run across, you'll see a red 16. That's the four by four. That gives it a red, um, red, which means it's an A hazard. So what that means is that's where we get this A. That means without any control measures put in place, it's considered an A hazard. So now let's look at putting some controls in place, and then we're going to try and see if we can mitigate that risk. So we can eliminate it. There's no substitution. But for engineering, we can put a guard in place. For administration, you can see it's got policies, procedures, training. 
And then for PPE, it lists the gloves, the boots, the face shield, the um, boots again, and then uh, hearing protection. So now, with when we do a, a hazard assessment again here now, we still the likelihood has changed, but the consequence is now a one. And I'll go back to the risk matrix once I explain this last little line. The likelihood is now, uh, the likelihood is still the same. You're still doing it on the same frequency that you do it, but the consequence is a one, which means it's it's the minimum, it's the first aid, but I'll show you that in a minute. Four times one is one. Where does that fall? It falls under a C. So if I go back here again, so again, if we look at the likelihood in the dark green, where it says weekly, it's a four. That's how often we're doing it. But now, if we have the pol, if we have, if we have the guard in place, and we have the policies, procedures, and we have all the appropriate PPE, the personal protective equipment, if something was to happen, it would likely be insignificant or only a first aid, which is a one, and the four times one is a four, and then that's where we get our green little four, and our green puts us in the place where we want to be, where we can just go on about our day, basically. So uh, hopefully that makes sense to you. I, I'll have a few questions later on here, but um, that's the basic way to do a hazard assessment. So when we go back to the hazard assessment here, what they've done is they've broken down each step of the task. And this is important. And we got to rate it each one. I know it seems a bit redundant, but we need to do this. The nice part is, is once you do this, um, depending on what category we give it, whether it's a high, medium, or low risk, is how often we're going to have to review this. And there's a little um, uh, trick slash method that I like to use is um, when we develop a risk assessment, um, we can develop a standard operating procedure because you can't have anything on your standard operating procedure that isn't identified this way in the risk assessment. Once we have that done, we need to write a competency test for every standard operating procedure. When we do that, we need to add two questions in amongst the questions that we ask for that uh, standard operating procedure. And one of the questions is, is there a step missing in this hazard assessment? And the other one is, is there a hazard missing in this uh, hazardous uh, assessment or SOP? And what that means is any time anyone reviews the SOP and writes the competency test, they are reviewing the hazard assessment. If they come up and find something new, um, then we need to address that. But if they review it and all is good, there's no additional hazards, there's no steps missed, that resets that clock of either the one year, the two to four year, or the five year plus for a renewal. So. Um, Especially when it comes down to auditing time, they're going to look at this. Um, I've seen it come up where there's been a, a workplace incident, and what they want to know is, I had an individual that, uh, long story short, two punctured, uh, uh, two broken vertebrae, one punctured lung, and is now a paraplegic. End of the story is when WorkSafe came on. They asked for a year of Joint Health and Safety Committee minutes, a year of um, workplace inspections, a year of crew talks, a year um, the incident event, or sorry, the SOP for the task that they were doing, the hazard assessment, and all training of all in individuals for the time of employment. So that's quite a strong demand, and luckily this uh, company was able to produce that, but it was still unfortunate for the individual that will never walk again. So although this might seem very tedious, the hazard assessment is how we build our standard operating procedure. We can't put something in our standard operating procedure unless it's been addressed and mitigated by risk um, by using the control measures. Um, I find the easiest way to understand this is to fumble through one or two. And there's some in your workbook. And if you need any help, please reach out to me on this one. Because once we get this done, the rest, it all falls into place. Although for the first time, it may seem very intimidating. It, it really isn't. Um, but it is the foundation of, of everything else. This is where we prove anything in our standard operating procedures. Because 
WorkSafe will ask for this. The audit is also going to ask for it as well. So that's the um, that's a risk matrix, or sorry, a hazard um, hazard assessment using the risk matrix and the hierarchy of control. So other methods of uh, identification uh, are workplace inspections, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on this one as we will be covering this in October, but I will say inspection of workplaces, equipment, and uh, work practices serve to identify hazards before they can result in an incident. Um, again, I'll go into further detail on this uh, come October uh, when we handle that uh, webinar. Another thing is workplace inspection checklists. I've given an example of two different ones that I created for a company. Um, we can look at some of the, the items that I'm talking about here. If we look on the left there, is the emergency lighting in place and regularly tested? Is there a posted evaluation of the plan for the shop? Are fire, there's a bunch of questions about fire extinguishers, exits, are guards on equipment? Um, if we look at the second page, it talks about a little bit about WIMIS. It talks about forklifts. It talks about lunchrooms. Um, I've even put on this one, if you look at the, the, the bottom section of either side of these, um, in the lunchroom they have their health and safety board. So some of the things that I put on this are to verify that the joint health and safety committee minutes are, are up to date, meaning are you posting three months at a time? Because three months need to be posted. Are workplace inspections up to date? Are crew talks posted? Are incident investigations posted? And in brackets I put no names, but you're not meant to have any names on that when you post. But these is just an example of a checklist that um, you can use or create on your own um, to do a workplace inspection. The downside, there is a need for workplace inspections because you can see this is only the top, it's not even the top half of either side of this page and you can see what detail it goes into. Um, the downside to using uh, an inspection checklist is people only look for what's on that list and they miss uh, other common things. So um, that's why training is really important. You need to have a checklist, I agree. And the more thorough it is, the better. And all you see is we're checking off or writing in an S for satisfactory, A needs attention, or NA not applicable. That's as simple as it needs to be. Um, but having a checklist, this, uh, you know, it's, it's preventative maintenance on your own health and safety program by doing a workplace inspection. You're, you're recognizing the hazards before the hazards. Uh, could come into effect. You may not need to have something this detailed, but this just goes to show you um, how you can simply create something. If you would like a copy of what I've done here for this company, I uh, just reach out to me and I'd be happy to send it to you, and then you can modify it to your own uh, facility. So another method of identification is an incident investigation. Uh, again, we're going to cover this one in October, so I'm not going to really get into it too much, but incident investigations, they prevent further occurrences. So if someone gets hurt and we don't investigate why it happened, how it happened, you haven't changed, let's say, the rules or the parameters for it not to happen again. So the same thing could happen again if we don't do anything about it. Uh, it helps identify the contributing uh, hazards. So with what we talked about, we got to look at the biological, chemical, physical, or psychological hazards. Right? Are we identifying them? Were they identified by the worker? Were they identified by the employer? Is it part of the management system or is it the individual and the human factor? We need to look at that. Investigations also look at how well your safe work procedures or standard operating procedures are. Maybe you don't have any. Maybe you do have some. Maybe they're written wrong. Maybe they're inaccurate. Um, most times, uh, I find that um, there isn't a standard operating procedure, and that having an incident, hopefully it's not a, a severe one, but it gives an opportunity to develop a standard operating procedure where we can uh, look at the potential hazards, use the hierarchy of control, and put control measures in place, and then um, roll it out that way in training and then have the individual sign off on the competency test. 
um, is key because then we can show as company we can show that we did what any other reasonable company did and we trained our, our workers again incident investigations a lot of times deals with the workplace inspections are the workplace inspections done how come it was caught how come it wasn't caught are workplace inspections being done? Could workplace inspections on a more frequent basis uh, eliminate this situation from occurring again? Other methods is to review the injury statistics and OHS analysis. So, OHS system reviews may uh, bring forward unidentified deficiencies in the program. Here I put in a copy of. Um, what some of my Joint Health and Safety Committee members use. They have their departments down the side, they have a location, whether it's one or two, lo three locations, and then they look at the nature of the injuries um, and they run across the top and what this does is it tracks, it tracks uh, uh, the current month, the year to date, and then the percentages and it will give the percentage of what, um, what injury and what department um, needs attention and it's not finger pointing, it's identifying trends. Uh, here's the same thing again but up at the top it's an incident classification so now we're looking at equipment damage, um, first aid, medical aids whether it's a motor vehicle, near misses which is a big one or time losses and then we're tracking if it's a young worker as well. Again this looks at month and year to date and has the percentages. A poll question. Um, we're getting to the review here of this section here. Noise thermal and vibrations are all examples of what hazard classification? Okay. We are all correct there, they're all physical. Next poll question. Correct, we're all psychological. Miss fumes are what kind of classification? Correct. Chemical is the right answer. Oh, now, when using a risk matrix, the corrective action for a B hazard is to. Correct. You guys are doing very well. Good for you. Okay, for the next one. When using the hierarchy of control, more than one control can be implemented to reduce the hazard. True or false? Okay, excellent. True is the correct answer. Is PPE considered the most effective or least effective control measure? Correct. You're doing very well. I'm, I'm glad you, that you're listening to me. So in summary, we talked about the hazard classes. We talked about the methods of identification. We talked about the risk matrix. And we talked about the hierarchy of control. Our next section here is hazard identification. We're going to look at uh, hazard identification and control program. And uh, we're going to touch on leading and lagging indicators. I know we're getting close to our one hour. Uh, hazard ID and control is the, I would say, the biggest element that has the most effect on others. So uh, I hope you all are willing to stay a little bit and, and we can get her done. Um, I'll try and move on as, as best as I can, but um, it is really important and it's, uh, it's the one that takes the most time to, to get through. So for hazard ID and control program, an effective program contains 
the job descriptions for all positions associated with the task. We talked about that. Then we need to involve the workers to help identify the hazards associated with the job task. So when we're doing the risk assessment, um, it, someone needs to be knowledgeable of the, what we're discussing today, but also knowledgeable of the uh, task or equipment that is being assessed, but also include the workers because um, the workers are the ones doing the work. And um, a lot of times, the more we involve the workers at this stage, the more compliant they're going to be. And I'm not sure how it is in your, your small companies, but in larger companies, there's a big divide between management and workers. And the more a worker can feel that they're contributing to the rules of work, uh, the more compliant they're going to be and the more buy-in that they're going to get. We need a formal process to assess the risks and prioritize the response. This is our risk matrix and our uh, using the risk matrix, this is our uh, uh, risk assessment. Step four is to implement the controls using the hierarchy of control. We discussed this. This is all kind of review uh, that we're running through here. So using eliminate, substitute, administration, uh, sorry, engineering, administration, and PPE. We need to train the employees. And then we need a regular review, which we talked about with the high risk, low risk, uh, high risk, medium, low risk. We're going to quickly talk about uh, two things, leading and lagging indicators. A lagging indicator measures the end results of the OHS process policies and procedures. They record things that have already happened. They inform a reactive health and safety culture. Some examples of these are workplace incidents, time loss claims, and work safety seen premium rate. So if you only look at those, you're looking at the results of what you're doing. Uh, it's things that are in the past. You, you can't change any of that. Leading indicators, on the other hand, focus on the future of health and safety performance. They um, encourage continuous improvement, and they are signal of, and monitor of what's being done on a regular basis to prevent workers um, from illness and injuries. Some examples of those are the amount of workers trained, SOPs, competency tests, hazard assessments, have they been written, how many hazard assessments have been done, uh, how many SOPs have been developed, how many near misses have been reported, because remember a near miss is a free warning. Under different circumstances, it could have had a different result. And then the amount of crew, sorry, crew or toolbox talks that you do are all examples of leading indicators. So we're back into some quick poll questions. The job description, hazard assessments, SOPs, and training are all part of a hazard identification program. True or false? Uh -huh. Thank you. They, it, it, is, it is true, and everybody got that right. The second polling question here, works AP premium rates are an example of which? Is it a leading indicator or is it a lagging indicator? Okay. Correct. It is a lagging indicator. Next one, the number of near misses reported is an example of either a leading or a lagging indicator. So this one was a bit of a split, just to re it is the, a leading indicator. If we're reporting um, the number of near misses, we're being proactive. Um, okay, next one. Which indicator has a, uh, a reactive health and safety culture? Leading or lagging indicator?
So the, the correct answer is the lagging indicator. Another question, which indicator focuses on future health and safety performance? Leading indicator or lagging indicator? Okay, 100% in here. And everybody is correct there. Okay, so our quick summary here. We talked about a hazard identification control program. We talked about the leading and lagging indicators. We'll quickly go through the OC requirements here. This won't take too long. And then uh, it should be done within five minutes here, I believe, or less. So we're going to review the hazard classes. Again, remember, this is what OC requires. It's generally going to be a review of what we've talked about. So we're going to look at the hazard classes, the method of identification, the risk matrix. So for the OC requirements, hazard identification, is there a formal process to identify hazards? If we use the risk matrix and we use the hazard assessment to develop uh, and our, sorry, and we use the hierarchy of control, we do have a formal process and that's what you want. Is the process include input from various sources? So as I said earlier, have someone that has this training know how to use the risk matrix, but they can go out to the floor and talk to the individuals. An individual on the floor will tell you what the potential hazards of that machine or equipment or task are. They may not be able to classify it the way that I've just told you guys how to do it, but they'll be able to tell you that. All health and safety hazards are considered in each kind of job task. For the risk assessment, is there a process to evaluate the risk for the hazards? So we've, we've shown that. Use the risk matrix. Use the hierarchy of control. Uh, are all health and safety hazards should be evaluated according to risk. So again, we're looking at health and safety and uh, health and safety hazards here. Is there a systematic uh, way to prioritize the hazards according to risk? Yes, this is our A, B, and C. When we're done there, this gives us our, our high, medium, and low risk overall. There's also, is there a process that includes the review of existing hazard identification? Again, we talked about this with the, the two questions. Is there a step missing? Is there a uh, hazard missing? And having a, a policy around uh, high risks are done yearly, um, medium risks are done two to four years, and low risks are done every five. And then we can reset the clock anytime anybody uh, reviews them or there's a change in process or there's an incident where we need to revisit them. Uh, individuals involved with the hazard identification and risk assessments have documented hazards and risk training. Again, this is just having our documentation in order. By filling out a hazard assessment, we've got our documentation. And then we also have to fill out our training as well. Is there a process for developing control measures? This is our hierarchy of control. Again, we need to ask the workers that are involved. Why? Because we get our buy-in. Um, sometimes they know more about the equipment than uh, I know in my bigger companies. Um, when I have management come off the floor or come down onto the floor to try and write uh, an operating procedure and a hazard assessment for a piece of machinery that they've never run, they, they're not the best people to do that. They can help write it, but we need the input from the workers. Uh, again, we're going to look at the hierarchy control. We're going to look at engineering controls. Have they been identified? We're going to look at administrative controls. Remember, this is um, policies, procedures, training, supervision, job rotation. Then we're going to look at having our standard operating procedures or work uh, procedures. Uh, have they been developed for the job? Um, safety uh, work procedures that match the current activities. So we need to have proper job descriptions and SOPs that match what we're doing. There's no point in having a, an SOP and have people train on a crane if we don't even have a gym crane in, in the facility. Um, have a process to identify the critical tasks, which we talked about. Um, that's identifying that, and sometimes it's, it's what you consider an A hazard. A critical task could also be something that's a B hazard that you've given it a, a medium rating. It all depends on how you guys um, want to assess that. The way I like to say it is what's the top 10 things that are going to hurt somebody? That's a, usually a good start to have your critical task. Um, again, with the work safe, 
procedures or standard operating procedures. Uh, we need training. People need to be aware of what they are. Um, and then how to follow up on that. Again, uh, when you have a competency test that not only, um, just like my poll questions, you're providing me a competency that you're understanding the material that's being delivered. The same way for a standing operating procedure. Just being shown how to do something and nodding yes and then being left alone to do it uh, might not be the best route, if, especially with a young worker that isn't going to tell you that uh, they don't know what they're doing or they're intimidated. And at, at least, or at last here, PPE, we need to look at what PPE is required, whether it's hi-hat, earwear, uh, hearing protection, visi vest, clothing, gloves, uh, boots, Whatever it is for your place, there, there needs to be a PPE. And we need to make sure that workers are also trained on the appropriate care. If we are, um, a lot of times people neglect the respirators. If you're wearing a half mass respirator, they're meant to be fit tested and they're meant to be put in a Ziploc bag and kept free from contaminants. Um, and often it's not done. Um, other OC requirements, enforcement. So management, I put in supervisors here because, uh, you know, whether you're a manager, supervisor, lead hand, you need to take responsibility and enforce to make sure that people are doing what they're doing. There also needs to be a way to, um, a system of how to uh, take defective equipment off the floor. With a small company, it's usually a matter of pulling it out and bringing it to management or someone that knows it. Uh, in bigger companies, they like to uh, write it down, fill out a tag, take it off, um, so it doesn't get put back into uh, production. It's uh, it's easier with a small uh, company on this one than it is a bigger company uh, to track. Um, and then document retention. There should be in your um, resource material a list of uh, uh, OHS requirements on document retention. Um, the government has a, a form. I will check to see if it's there. If not, reach out to me and I'll get you a copy of that. And it will tell you how long you need to keep uh, documentation, OHS documentation, or, or as it pertains to the documentation. Um, it says here that the, this is a common way to lose uh, audit points. Um, more importantly, if you don't have the documentation, you can't prove that it happened. When WorkSafe comes on site, the best way to prove what you're doing is to have the documentation saying that you've done it. Uh, again, um, my saying here, the three most famous words in real estate is location, location, location. In health and safety, it's document, document, document. If it's not documented, it never happened. So in summary here, uh, we talked about the hazard classes. We talked about the method of identification, the risk matrix, and all of these, what we discussed, are OC requirements. They're not just, um, they're what a company needs to do anyways. Uh, it also gives you points towards the audit, and um, this is the number one category that uh, affects, has the most influence on all the other elements, is the hazard ID and control. I believe there's three more questions and then uh, we're done here. So who is responsible for identifying hazard in the workplace? The managers, supervisors, workers, or all of the above? Correct, all of the above. Everybody has a role to play. What are the four main categories of classifying hazards? Yeah, four of the five responded there, and yes, correct. Biological, chemical, physical, and psychological. Good for you guys. That was kind of a trick question there that I wanted to see who was paying attention. So last, um, is PPE considered the most effective or least effective control measure? Okay, we've got 80% again. So that's good enough for me. Um, yep, correct. It is the least effective. 
Oh, we have one more here. Percentage of workers trained, the number of SOPs, near misses, crew talks, um, toolbox talks are examples of. Is it a leading indicator or a lagging indicator? Yeah, there we go, 100%. Everyone's voted on this one. Yeah, correct. Leading indicator. Very good. So as an overall review, we talked about the legislation. We talked about identification method, the hazard identification control program, OC requirements. My closing notes is this is the biggest one. It's taken the longest time, but it's also one of the longest ones to uh, develop over time, being a small company. Uh, maybe you only have a few pieces of equipment or tasks that need to be done. Um, but the sooner you get started on this one, the better. Um, um, if you, uh, let's see, there's a template to follow, follow for the hazard assessments. Uh, that's available in your binder. There should be a copy of that risk matrix in your binder. Um, if you need further explanation or would like me to look over something, please uh, send it my way. If I can give you any more information or you'd like something explained again, send me an email, please. And then there it is right there. I'm ahead of myself. So if you need assistance, send us an email. We are 15 minutes beyond our time, so I don't think we uh, have, I think that's fair to say uh, you've answered quite a few uh, questions. on, um, And um, some of your questions have been answered uh, as we were going along. If you do have any further questions, uh, just give me an email. Our next webinar topic will be later this month, and it will be part one of industry-specific control programs. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this. I apologize for going a bit over time, but as you can see, I was rushing through, but there, there's a lot to be done. But um, uh, please let me know what you thought of the amount of poll questions we tried. Maybe I need to take a little out. Um, but for me, it showed a lot of uh, competency and, and retention that um, uh, from an instructor. It means that uh, I was communicating it well enough uh, for you guys to understand it. So I appreciate that. So uh, let me know what you think of the poll questions. Other than that, thank you very much, and we'll see you in three weeks. Have a good day.